So uh, first, I post uh, some uh, materials on the uh, Verilog coding and the MIPS assembly codes on the Sakai. So if you don't have the, the prior experience for the hardware design or the assembly code, so you can take a look at those the materials and uh, learn by yourself. And if you have any questions, so you're welcome to reach me. And the second, the solution for the homework too has been already posted on the Sakai, so you can check that. The mentioned for the homo three that will be in the November, so I will let you know when I post it. And also for the online quiz two, that will be uh, probably on the in the November late November. So any questions for the homework and quiz? And also again, so I hope that you, uh, you'd better to begin your final project as soon as possible. So especially if you want to do some other topics, that is okay, but you need to first to contact me and to let me know your plan. Any questions? And also in the November, I will set a deadline for you to inform me your plan for your teaming plan for your final project. So I will send an email this week, let you know the deadline you need to, because I need to uh, summarize the how many teams we will have in this class for the final project. So you need better to, to decision whether you want to team up with other students or and and or who you want to team up with. And I also hope that this can motivate you begin to think about what you want to do for your final project. Any questions? And uh, also for such statistics, also help me to to plan for the potential presentation schedule of your final project. So the schedule depends on two factors. First is the number of the teams, and second it depends on the progress of of our lectures. So as I mentioned before, so the uh, part three of this course is about a domain specific AI hardware architecture. So this is a very broad topic, and uh, actually, uh, if you want, so actually we can use the one or two semester course to cover this. So uh, let's see. So how about our progress? the phase one, uh, part one and part two. And if necessary, so uh, I may use the, the two, two classes previously for the final project presentation to also to be used for the hardware accelerator architecture for the AI. So that is an option. The, I'm not determined yet. I also need to know this 
how many how many teams that we will have for the final project. And uh, so that means there's one possibility that so we will skip the presentation of the, the final project. And uh, in that case, you will directly send me your final report. Any questions? By the way, so how about your current uh, status of your final project? So how many of you already formed the team? Anyone or no one? So how about uh, your team size? One or two or three students? Okay. So how about the option you want to cho choose the literature survey or the development or the implementation? Yes, if you want, you can just work by yourself. That's fine. So when you have the, the multi student teams so actually for your fight for the uh workload of your final projects will be higher. Definitely. So right now, what type of the, the final project you plan to go for? Paper survey or the research, do some research or do some de development, which one? Okay. Okay. It looks like many many teams go for the literature survey. That's fine. And uh, specifically, if you want to do some of the research, decide to do the research or do development, you'd better to contact me, and I can give you some guideline and tell you what about my expectation requirement for those two options. And for the literature survey, so what I want to let you know that so. So the literature survey, this is not, even you are just the one student team. So that is not just for one paper. That should be for the multiple papers that related to the one topic. And if, especially if you have the, like three, three students for the literature survey. So my expectation for the paper that you have a deep study that should be, the number of those papers should be large. Because please note that uh, this is a final project and we don't have the final exam. So you, so in your report, so you should show the efforts. So here, I, I don't have a kind of the fixed number of the papers you should uh, review the survey. Because for a standard literature survey paper, so actually uh, you can go to the archive to see that. So, for example, a literature survey for the AI hardware, that typically that will contains many, many, the reference list, it contains the more than 100, even 200 papers. So here, what you are, you will do is kind of the, the mini survey, not too many, but still it should show some of the 
your efforts there. So you can pick some of the subfield. For example, you can do some of the interest survey like for the sparse convolution network or something like the low bit network hardware, something like that. So it's kind of the subfield and the, you should uh, read several papers that have that represent the general idea represent the kind of the, the milestone in the development of this field and represent the state of arts different categories of the approaches and so on so any questions Okay, so no more questions. Let's continue our class. So this is where we were last Friday. So three type of the dependency, low dependency, anti-dependency and output dependency. And uh, actually they correspond to the Three types of the, the either the read after write, write after read, and the read and the write after write. And why we named like that? For example, for the flow dependency. So we will update R three register. So this is a write, right? And then we will read R three register. As the operand, the next instruction. So this is a read after write because this is write, this is read. And for the write after read, so we will use the R1 in the in the previous instructions for the to, but just to read this value, and then we will update to write R1. That's right after read. And we're after right after, uh, sorry, right after right. So in this example, in the first and the third instructions, R3 will be right. Two different instructions. So this is right after right. Output dependency. Any questions? Okay, so then so for the read up uh, it's nine twenty. Yep. Go, go ahead. Um, Hello. Can you repeat your question again? Sorry, Professor. No, okay. So for the flow dependency for this read after write, so actually it's the true data dependency. So this is because actually, if we revisit our task, or our mission for these instructions, we will see that so actually or logically, so the value of the R3 depends on the, in the second instruction, it depends on the value of the R3 in the first instruction, right? So it's a true data dependency. So we must have the, the updated R3 available and then we can have the correct execution for the second instruction. While for the anti dependency here, so actually, 
but R1 in the second instruction, its value doesn't necessarily depend on the value of the, the R1 in the first instruction. Right. So R1 is a register. It contains some value. So actually, the name of a register it doesn't matter very much. Actually, what we care about is about its value, its content. Right. For the R3 or in the first instructions, yes, its value depends on the value in the R1. But for the second instruction, so R1, actually, we just want to use the, some register to store the, the operation results between the R4 and R5, right? So actually here, we don't have a true data dependency. And similar for the output dependency here, So in the first instructions, we used R3 to store the results of the operation between R1 and R2. And then in the third instructions, again, we used the R3 to store the results of the operation between R6 and 7. But here, these two results actually, they don't, we don't establish a dependency between them. Is that right? So essentially, actually, it's a kind of the name dependency, not a data dependency. Any questions? Okay, later we will see that how should we solve this two, this different type of dependency. So now, uh, exercise time. So for this segment of the code, the instructions, so can you identify where we have the flow dependency, where we have the output dependency, where we have the empty dependency? Okay, I can uh, I can briefly explain the meaning of each instruction. So the first one, actually, we perform the division between the F2 and F4. The results is updated to the F0. And for the second one, F0 and F8, their values added together, and then the sum is updated to the F6 register. And for the third one, this is the this is the store instruction. So that means that so we send the current value of the F6 to the memory. And each each address is identified is identified by the x1's value and offset zero. This is safe. This, sorry, this is the store. And for the fourth instructions, actually we subtract F14 from the F10 and then the results is updated to the F8. And finally, the fifth instruction, so we must the result of F10 and F8 and the results come to the six. So here is the, the function of each instruction. So now tell me, whether we have the flow dependency, whether we have the output dependency, whether we have anti-dependency. If so, so where are they? Notice that you may we may have the, the multiple flow dependency, and the multiple output dependency, and the multiple anti-dependency. 
but now practice on that. So, so no, not just to give me one answer because we may have the multiple answers for different sub questions. So lay out all of them. And also notice that when we talk about dependency, actually it should be connected to the, it's involved with the two instructions. You should tell me, so there exists, for example, there exists a flow dependency between which two instructions. I will give you a Six minutes to practice this. Also, please identify. So when two instructions, there exist a dependency, that dependency is on which register?
Okay, so now let's take a look at that. So first, flow dependency. There exists the three flow dependency here. So the first one is first instruction and the second one, right? For the register F0, right? F0, at, in the first instruction, it will be updated. And then the result, the updated result will be used in the second instruction, right? Read up the right, all right? And we also have another flow dependency between the fourth and the fifth instructions for the register F8, right? All right. And uh, another one that is between the second and the third instructions. So notice that here the F6 will be updated, will be written in the second instructions. And these new results will be then in the third instructions. Notice that because this is stored, that means that we need to transfer the value in the register to the memory. Right, so this is write, this is read. Another write, read after write. All right. So three flow dependency here. Any questions? The output dependency. Output dependency is right after right, right? So here we have one output dependency between the second and the fifth instructions for the register F6. In the second instructions, F6 will be updated, right? And in the Fifth instruction F6 will also be updated. So notice that for the third instruction F6, it is not be updated. We will use the update F6 to update one content in the memory. However, if we change this F, this store ins instruction, and we change it like to the load. Or FLD load. Because, because for the store. For the store instruction. As many of you have already learned in the undergraduate computer architecture. So this is the store that is to from the register to your memory. Well, for the load, that is from your memory to your register. So from the perspective that the register store, that is a read operation, while for the load, that is the write operation. So if I change the instructions from the store to the load, that means that you have we will introduce the more output dependency. Because right now for the third instructions, we will write F6. Is that clear? And then anti-dependency.
So here we have the two antidependency. First is between second and the fourth instruction on the register F8. So in the third instruction, we will read F8, and then in the fourth instruction, we are write after it. So this is write after read. And also between the third and the fifth for the register F6, in the second, in the third instruction, we are read F6, and in the fifth instruction, we will write F6. It's an anti dependency. Okay. Any questions? No questions. I hope I hope uh can you explain the can you explain the second? You mean the second antidependency in this in this slide or the previous slide? Okay, so the second antidependency here, right? Their meaning? Okay. So first, so what is antidependency? It's a right after read, right? So for the previous instruction, so we will, for that target register, we will read that, and then for the full instructions, we will write that read register. That is antidependency. Right? Okay. So now. For the anti dependency involved with F6 register. So here yeah, we claim that there exists anti dependency between the third FSD and FML, FMUL instruction, the third and the fifth. So why? So for the third instruction, this is a store operation. Store means that we send the value of register F6 to the memory. When memory, notice that here this actually, it represents a memory address. X1 is the register as well. And here, zero X1 means that we have a we will use the information contained in the X1, that is address. This is the so-called base address. Base address. And the zero here, it is the offset value. The zero can be changed, depends on what you want. It can be four, be eight, be 12, but typically that is the multiple of the multiple of the four. So if you took the undergraduate undergraduate computer architecture, you know that is we need to make sure the memory alignment. Okay. So essentially, so here this actually rep it represents one address in your memory. In your memory. And this instruction, it means that we will send the value of the F6 to one memory entry. And that memory entry, its address is defined by this, can be calculated by this. So you can see that for the register F6, its operation actually is a read. We read this F6, right? And we will write to one memory entry. 
while for the fifth instruction, F6, it will be updated. Our operation to F6 is the write. So this is a write after read. So it's an anti dependence. Is that clear right now? Any other questions? No questions? Okay, so let's continue. So now let's move to the next phase, how to handle dependency right now. You know to manually to identify those dependencies. And now, once we find that we have such dependencies, how can we solve them? Especially solve a flow dependency because it's a true data dependency. Okay. The first flow dependency. So generally speaking, we have the three types of flow dependency, the mitigation master. First is detect that, and then for using the so-called forward bypass strategy. It's a very common used one. And the second is to wait. It's kind of, the second is very straightforward. Once we find that, we just wait. We store the entire pipeline until just the value right now is available in the register. And the third is we can predict, and then we guess what we want, and then to execute, and then finally verify, go back to verify. So let's first to take a look at bypass the forwarding. So now let's take a look at this example. So for the flow dependency between the, these two instructions on the register number two, note that here this is we used the MIPS as an example. So in the first sub instructions, register two, it will be update, right? And its value will be used for the second instruction. And so this is a read after write, right? So this is a flow dependency, true data dependency. Right. So now let's take a look at that. So notice that our, our essential goal for the second instruction, actually, we want to have the, the correct value in the register two, right? So let's see what's where does such value come out. So if if we observe the pipeline diagram, what do we can find that? So for the new value of the number two, register number two, actually, so after the third stage, the third cycle, the exe stage, the result will already be available. Right, but uh, this value when it is, when it is av avail available at the end of the cycle three, actually it has not been officially stored back in the register file. Right, officially it will have that at that is at the end of the cycle five, but at the end of the cycle three it already be there, it already exists in your data pass. 
Is that right? And meanwhile, for your second instruction, when you need the new value of the register number two, where you need that, so you can find that actually you need that at the beginning of the clock cycle four. Is that right? So actually, when we at the beginning of clock cycle four, so we, the new value, the, the desired value of the register number two is already there, right? Already exists somewhere in your data path. And as long as we can get that, so we can continually to execute the second instruction. Is that right? Any questions? Or do you need me to re-explain again? Yes or no? For the, uh, something to ask for the richest number two, they should be continuous. So what, what do you mean for the continuous? Like we have in flow, read after write. Okay, so now let me re, re explain. I know some of you already learned that in, in undergrad, undergraduate computer arc, but some of you never learned that before. Okay, let me repeat again. So, first, here is what we have we have the five instructions for a program, a mini program. And now, Based on what you have just learned for the data dependency, we know that so there exists the flow dependency between the instruction one and two, right? The sub and add, and and actually we also have another flow dependency still on the register two between the one between the first and the third instruction. Is that right? Okay, so here that's the dependency. And why it matters because so if we use the naive way, so the register number two, the register two will have these new values at the end of the clock cycle five. But for the third instruction, sorry, for the second instruction, we need net new value at the beginning of the clock cycle four. Right? And for the third instructions, we need that new value of the register two at the beginning of the clock cycle five. But here from this diagram, we know that the new value of the register number two, it will be only available at the end of the clock cycle five. That means that when we want to execute the second and third instructions, we don't have the data available. That is a problem. That is why we call that the hazard, right? So now, a good thing that after our deep observation, what do we find? We find that the new value of the register two, it already come out at the end of the clock cycle three, right? 
although it should be officially stored back to the register two at the end of the clock cycle five, but physically it's already been there. It already be in some place in your data path at the end of the clock cycle three. So that gives us opportunity opportunity to solve this flow dependency, right? Because for your second instruction, you need the new value of the register two at the beginning of the clock cycle four. So actually, that means that at that time, the data is already available for the new value of the register two. Is that right? So as long as that you can find a method to identify that value, because right now that value is not stored in the register number two. It's stored some, some place, some other places. As soon as that you can find that, and then you can directly input that value to your exe stage of the instruction two. And similar to the third instruction. Is that clear now? Any other questions? Okay. Actually, this slide just uh, expands what I'm just talking about. So here, essentially, we pass because the exe. This is a, this stage is to do the execution to do the arithmetic operation using the ALU, we have an ALU. And the input is the one and the three, value of the register one and three, and output is the results, right? If the results at the clock cycle five will officially read back, written back to the register two, but the ALU output at the end of clock cycle three already have that results. That means that we can directly send this output of ALU to the in the clock cycle four for the use of the end operation without go through in the register five. So that is why we call this a so called a bypass. Okay, and uh, I think this figure sh shows the idea more clearly. Conventionally, you have the results in the clock at the end of the clock cycle three, but you will need to continue to go through two following cycles, and then at the end of clock cycle five, your register two will have the new results. But we cannot wait so late for the second and the third instructions. So that means that, notice that we have the pipeline register between the each two different stages. So the, re, the output of ALU, the subtraction, the difference between the one register one to three, at the end of the clock cycle three will be already stored in this pipeline register. So that means at the beginning of the clock cycle four, we can directly find that value from the pipeline register and then send it to the ALU as it's another input. So we directly forward with these results to the ALU. But we can say we bypass the register file operation. Is 
Is that clear now? And similar regarding the flow dependence between the first and the third instruction, again on the register two, and the <clears throat> you can do the similar thing. You can directly forward the new value of the two, register number two, to the AL input in the in the cycle five for the third O operation. Any questions? No questions? Okay. And then, so, some more details. Actually, this is useful. You, for example, if you want to like to implement the mechanism of the handling the data hazard. So actually, this is related to more details. So how can we identify whether we have such the flow dependency or not? Note that here, what I mean that the identify is not just a matter of identify. That means that if we want to write some code, if we want to implement like in, in the C or use the Verilog to do that, for example, if you want to build a simple CPU state pass, so you must provide the mechanism of the, to detect the data hazard and to solve the data hazard. Those the dependency. Okay. And the case is what? So recall that. So what is the condition when we determine here we have the flow dependency? So first, we have to the read and write, read after write, right? And such read after write, actually that is targeted for the same register, right? And we know that for the previous instructions, that involved register is being written. And for the following instructions, the involved register, it is read. That is two conditions, right? And then, so actually, we can establish the determining mechanism for that. Note that this is involved with the implementation. Involved with implementation. So I don't want to uh, specify too much details, too many details. But if you want to do some of the Verilog or the C implementations, so you should take care of this. So actually, how we know physically, how we know the name of the, the registers. So actually we need to find them in your pipeline registers. Your pipeline registers store those informations. And also the corresponding control signals. And notice that, so this 
is the pipeline registers IDEX. And this is the pipeline registers EX MEM. Okay. So then, notice that this is not just a one register. Actually, this is a, a set of registers, like for the IEX and for the EXMEM. And uh, here, actually, we can first get RD and RS. RD means the destination register. RS means the source register. Here we follow the format or in the MIPS ISA. And you can see that if the destination register in the EXMEM, in the EXMEM, because at the same clock cycle, At the same clock cycle, so here the EXMEM register sets. Actually, at that moment, it will it store its destination register is two number two, while for the IDEX, its source one source register is the number two. So using this way we can match the name here. And then at the same time, if we can identify here for the sub instruction, we know that it's right operation signal. We can get that information from the EXMEM pipeline registers. If we can identify this, certify these two conditions, so then we know that we have the data hazard. We have the flow dependency. And at this moment, actually, we can solve that using the forwarding. And a similar, maybe you have another instruction, like a, another register name here, have the dependency. So because for the like for the end instruction we have the two operands. In that case you need to find that whether this another one is RT. RT is also the resource the source name. That is why we have the, the two different cases here. Any questions? Or do you need me to explain again? Okay, so here the key idea is that, so we must satisfy, because if you want to determine whether we have the flow dependency here, in this example, we must set, satisfy two conditions. First,
The first is that, so your destination, the register you want to write in the previous instructions, that is exactly the register you want to read in the second instruction, right? So first, the name should match. Right? And how to determine that? Because notice that, like for example, at this moment, at the clock cycle, just just at the clock cycle three. So you have the pipeline register here, E X M E N. Notice that this is a pipeline registers. This is not a register budget for your data pass. This is a another a set of registers. All of your information of these instructions here is stored here. And why it's stored here? So you can go back to check your undergraduate computer architecture course right there. We, we cannot explain all of them. So the register information, like the, the register three, register one, register two, their name is there. And we know that it is the RD. For the register two, because it's a so-called destination register. This is RD. And meanwhile, for your second instruction at this moment, there, because we here we use the pipeline processing, their information is stored here. The RD in the IDEXE here is the 12, and the RS is the two, RT is five. All of these three involve the register, registers, their name in the instruction two, their information is stored here. Okay, and then you can check these two different pipeline registers to fetch their RD and RS and to compare whether they are same or not. If it's same, that means that yes, for the second instructions, you have one registers, it's source register, and for your first instructions, you have the destination register, their name matches. And then we can check the first instruction, first the conditions. And also notice that we still need to satisfy the second condition. That is your first instruction, it's your destination, your register, true, should be written. And how to determine that? Again, your pipeline register contain all of those information. It have a control signal. Let's know that this instruction it should be right, should be written. And then the second condition, and check that. In that case, we know that we have the flow dependency and this flow dependency can be solved by using the forwarding. And then we enable the forwarding signal. Is that clear now? Other questions? Okay, so there are a little bit complicated case. Again, we still have the flow dependency. Notice here, in this example, we have the three consecutive instructions. And for the first instruction, register one will be updating. And then we will use the new value of the register one to first update itself. And then we will, in the third instruction, we will read the latest value. So there, here, this is a complicated case. So which value we should forward for the use of the third instruction? Obviously, we should forward the latest value, right? 
output by the second by the ALU in the second instruction instead of the, the ALU's output in the first instruction because that is not the latest value. Right. Your questions? And in this case, so actually the condition, the determ determination mechanism is even more complicated. Because you need to consider about the three, the register name information of three instructions. And those instructions, their information will be stored in the three type of pipeline registers. MEM, WB, EX, MEM, and IDEX. So here, when the sir, when the First instruction, we can know that it is, yes, we want to write that. And uh, we know that, so the third, the second and the third instructions, they are involved in the register name that is ma the matches. And uh, meanwhile, uh, hold on a moment. This is the ID, this is the EXE, this is the MEM, this is WB. And the MEM WB pipeline register, this stores the information of the first instruction. And the EXE MEM, it stores the information of the Second instruction and IDX is stored information of the third instruction. Okay, that means if you are, if you first instruction, we want to write that. And uh, your first and uh, and your first and the third instructions, they are the same. They they, they involve the same register name. And your and your first, oh, sorry, and your second and your third instructions, they don't involve the same register name. Or your second instruction, it is not about the right. In that case, you can forward the value of the, the forward the output. You can forward the ALUs in the first instructions to the user for the second for the third one. Okay. So this is a bit <laughs> complicated. So here this this mechanism actually it is to avoid this example. Because when you have such example, that means that it should be like this. Right? You need want to do the forwarding between the two adjacent instructions. But if it's not such case, 
That means that, for example, here, you have data dependency between the third and the first instruction. And in that case, you should forward like this, right? But we should exclude the potential situation just like this example shows. And how to exclude this one? You will see these two mechanisms. Any questions? So here, I understand this is still a bit abstracted. So if you don't intend to like to implement that, so you just need to know the, the overall idea. So the those the pipeline registers store the information of your instructions. So the name of the, the involved register in each instruction, you can fetch them from your pipeline register and then to try to match them. And then to also, whether we have the register write or read can be found in your pipeline register. So you can leverage those informations and then to form your judgment. So that is the general idea here. And more specifically, so actually that is kind of in the microarchitecture level. So as we were introduced in the next in lecture. So actually, according to this, the, the mechanism, we can write some, the, the implement some of the for, so-called forwarding units. Such forwarding units, it will have the, those, the forwarding signal. And then to physically implement such forwarding operations. So you can see that the information of those the pipeline registers, some of them we will connect them to the forwarding unit to help the forwarding unit to determine its decision. And this is a bit already out of the scope of this course. So if you if you want to implement them like in your final project, then you can study that in more details about that. And you can also reach me if you have any questions. I just want to give you some of the impressions. So what is the high level idea and how to map them in your actual architecture or the circuit design? For example, you can use, you can develop them using the Verilog implement those functions. And if you're interested, I think you can do that in your final project to design or implement a simple data path that can handle those the dependency. But not just this one, but all of three type of dependency. Okay, so any questions? So if no more questions, so that is the end of the today's class. So see you this Friday.